Dark Cast Network, Indie Pods with a Dark Side. me Ashley I am alive and not deceased sorry for the break I work a full-time job and I do this podcast from start to finish simultaneously so the past few weeks have been super busy so I apologize that I have not been able to get an episode out but there are some exciting things on the horizon well I find them exciting you might not but if you don't then that's fine um I'm currently working on two cases with two different people I'm going to be covering a case with somebody else on the podcast network. And about two months ago, I was approached by somebody that just got out of prison for serving a sentence for something that I'm going to keep a secret. And they wanted me to do some research on what happened to them. So I'm going to be covering that as well. So stay tuned for that. Real quick before I jump into the case, if I sound all fucked up, uh, it's because I am. I don't know if any of you are also going through this, but I've been getting allergy shots for. I don't know, a year. And for some reason this season, I am just getting fucking annihilated by mold, dust, whatever. Fuck it all. So if I sound all fucked up, that's why. Don't judge me or judge me. I don't really care either way. So today I'm going to bring it way back and cover a very old but infamous case. I'm going to talk about Elizabeth Bathory, who was also known as the Blood Countess. So Consider that to be your trigger warning. Uh, This bitch was fucking insane. And I'm going to talk about some stuff. So just trigger warning all over this entire episode because deranged doesn't even begin to cover how batshit insane she is. She might be a horse girl. She, She was probably a horse girl. Let's be serious. We all know that horse girls are crazy. Uh, if any of you are actually horse girls, I love you so much. So Elizabeth was a noblewoman from Hungary who was widely believed to have tortured and killed numerous young girls in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. The exact number of victims still remains a subject of debate today, but there are a shit ton of sources that suggest it could be as high as 650. I'm going to say that one more time. 650 people. Six, five, zero. I don't even think I've encountered 650 different people in my lifetime, so that's a lot. Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7th, 1560, into one of Hungary's most powerful and influential families, the noble family of Bathory. Elizabeth's family had a long and distinguished history, and they played a very important role in Hungarian politics for centuries. But while Elizabeth's family was widely respected, they were also very much feared. And this is because they had a history of severe mental illness and violent behavior. Some historians speculate that this could likely be what contributed to Elizabeth's own sadistic tendencies that came to fruition later in her life. But again, that's just speculation. I like history, so you guys are going to get a little bit of history. But at the time of her birth, Hungary was divided into three separate areas. Northern Hungary, and a large part of Transdanubia, which is the traditional region of Hungary. And this was under control of Turkish satraps. And then Western Hungary fell under Habsburg control, which was the House of Austria. And Transylvania remained largely independent. And Elizabeth actually spent most of her childhood in the Transylvania area, which is fitting since she's known as the Blood Countess. And we all know that vampires are associated with Transylvania, so I feel like that's really poetic in a sense. According to historical records, Elizabeth was a bright and curious child, and she received a very good education, obviously, because she was noble, in languages, music, and literature. She grew up at Exed Castle, which was one of her family's several estates, because they obviously didn't have one or two, they had several, and Elizabeth was raised by an entourage of servants and tutors. Historical records of Elizabeth's life prior to her crimes are sparse, and many of the details surrounding her early life and upbringing have been lost to history, 
So much of what we know about her comes from later accounts written by people who were not alive actually during her lifetime. According to Elizabeth's diaries from childhood, Elizabeth suffered from seizures, which her father did as well. Elizabeth was known to have fits of rage as a child, and during her later years, her diary entries described both eye and head pain that caused her several problems. This was likely migraines and epilepsy, which were obviously not yet a medical diagnosis at that point in time. Something that has been widely confirmed is that mental illness was prevalent in the family, particularly from inbreeding, but some of the alleged insanities were also typical of aristocratic eccentricities at that time. More money, more problems, mentally, I guess. So during this time in history, nobles such as Elizabeth's family were legally able to do pretty much whatever the fuck they wanted. They were able to settle disputes that they had with their peasants legally on their own, and this meant that the family could serve as the judge and the jury and dispense essentially any judgment that they saw fit for the crime, and that included death. This essentially meant that at this time, servants were dealt with harshly, and it is pretty much guaranteed that Elizabeth witnessed several brutal public executions. At this time, peasants lacked any legal rights and unusual punishments were typically doled out in a way that made them an example, ensuring that other peasants stayed in line. Additionally, during this time, gypsies were viewed as subhuman by the ruling classes, and it is hypothesized that Elizabeth witnessed an event where a gypsy was sentenced to death in a very strange and fucked up manner. This doesn't make sense to me for a multitude of reasons, but the one that I'm going to focus on is the manner of death that they chose. So they're like, okay, we're going to sentence this gypsy to death. How are we going to kill said person? We're going to fucking sew them into a live horse. I don't know how this works, nor do I want to imagine it because I already sleep like shit as is, but I can imagine why a young Elizabeth Bathory seeing a live fucking person being sewn somehow into a live horse would certainly set her on a path of, I don't know, sadistic behavior. As if that live reenactment of Luke Skywalker cutting open a tauntaun on Hoth to stay warm and then sleeping inside of it, as if that dramatic recreation wasn't enough for Elizabeth Bathory, things got more difficult for her when, at the young age of 15, she was married off to Count Frank Nedazdi. So a lot of these names are not names that I know how to pronounce. I did look up pronunciation for a lot of them, but they are old names, a lot of them. So just bear with me. I'm going to try my best, but Count Frank Nedazdi. And Frank was a much older soldier and war hero who was also a member of one of Hungary's most prominent families. So now you have two very, very prominent wealthy families coming together. This was seen as a way to consolidate their power and wealth. Elizabeth and Ferenc went on to have four children together, and they lived a very lavish lifestyle at their castle in Kachtis. And during this time, Elizabeth became known for her beauty and her charm, and she became very popular among the local nobility. The marriage between Elizabeth and Frank did have many issues, and one of which was that he was often away on military campaigns, leaving Elizabeth in charge of their humongous fucking estate and all of its affairs. It is widely believed that around this time, Elizabeth began to indulge in her sadistic curiosities, and this is when she began to torture and kill young peasant girls that worked on her castle. Elizabeth's husband, Frank, was also known for his cruelty and actually had the nickname, quote, the Black Knight of Hungary. And this was because of his military exploits. It is believed that he was actually the one that introduced Elizabeth to the world of sadomasochism and torture, and that they would often indulge in these activities together. I'm not really sure what kind of spousal bonding this is. I don't know that I would want to participate in this with my spouse, but to each his own, I suppose. 
The relationship between Frank and Elizabeth is uncertain, but there is witness testimony that implies that she ultimately was a good wife and a good mother. Publicly. She did everything she needed to do to maintain a wholesome image when she was everything but. Elizabeth attended official functions. She practiced religion devoutly. She gave money to the poor. Okay, Robin Hood. She protected widows. She assisted with health care in the region. So she really did a good job of maintaining the doting wife, the respected noblewoman that did what she could for her community. As Frank prepared for battle against the Ottoman Turks, he became a renowned captain in the Hungarian army. And this meant that he was going to now leave Elizabeth alone for even longer periods of time at their castle estate. During this time, Elizabeth allegedly made frequent visits to her aunt Clara to learn about witchcraft and torture. Many historians suggest that Elizabeth engaged in a lot of sexual horseplay with male servants around this time, but there's really no evidence that is given in trial documents or eyewitness testimony, except for one instance of infidelity with a young soldier. Some witnesses mentioned that certain portions of their castle was under guard and access was forbidden. Some believed that it was because of sex play, but a lot of the servants suggested that this was actually for torture rather than illicit sex play. Frank often did as he pleased within their marriage, and Elizabeth was known to be the passive partner throughout the majority of their marriage, which is surprising because she's a crazy fucking bitch. Eventually, in her mid-20s, Elizabeth settled into a routine. She managed the family's properties and staff while her husband was away fighting the Turks. Her daily routine included a very lengthy process of dressing, managing the estate and staff, consulting with court officials and supervisors, dictating letters, paying bills, reviewing documents, and receiving visitors. This all sounds like very Game of Thrones. I'm just going to sit in this throne made out of 10,000 swords and just listen to all of these people throw bullshit business nonsense at me while I fall asleep. Very riveting. Elizabeth did make time for play, as royalty does 99% of the time, and her leisure activities included horseback riding. So I actually forgot about this. <laughs> And I said that I thought that she was a horse, horse girl earlier, and I was fucking right. Horseback riding, picnics, hunts, driving into town, and reading. Very posh. The household staff was divided primarily into male servants who answered only to Frank, and the female servants, they answered to Elizabeth, and there were lesser of those. Elizabeth was responsible for pretty much doing everything in the household that Frank didn't want to do, and that included the running the holdings and arbitrating disputes for any servants and locals, maintaining defenses against the Turks along the border, and conducting sensitive matters of diplomacy. As such, there were no obvious signs of her becoming a serial killer as she was very active in the community and within her family. Sometime around 1585, it could be give or take a year, and this is approximately 10 years after Elizabeth and Frank were married, they welcomed a daughter named Anna. The couple eventually had five children, including their first daughter, Anna, or Solia, and Catalin, and they had sons, Andras and Paul. Their son, Andras, died at age seven, and their daughter, Orsica, died by 1610. Elizabeth's will in 1610 identified only three surviving children, so her first daughter, Anna, then there was Catalin, and then her son, Paul, who would essentially receive the estate at that point since he was the only male heir. Frank fell ill in March of 1601 in Bratislava, and he began to experience severe leg pain, which essentially rendered him unable to stand, which is not ideal as he is, you know, he's in the military. He's a big mover at this point in time. He did eventually recover and began to resume his public duties. In August of 1602, Frank met a man named Count, I'm going to try really hard here, guys, but it's going to be bad, Georgi Thurzo. Trying real hard. They led a campaign together against the Turks, and they became very well acquainted and very close. But ironically, Thurzo would later play a major role in Elizabeth's trial, which I'll get into later. 
Frank fell ill again in 1603, but this time he fell gravely ill. He ended up becoming permanently disabled, so at this point he began to prepare his family and friends for his inevitable demise. Frank entrusted two letters to messengers prior to his passing, one to another man named Frank, which asked him to protect his wife and children, and the other to his homie Georgie Thorzo, entrusting his heirs and widow under his protection. He died on January 4th, 1604, and of course, his funeral was a lavish, military-styled affair filled with lots of pomp and frills. This is weird to me. I feel like even if I was rich, I just, like, I don't understand huge funerals. Personally, I would want to do something simple. I think I'd want to do, like, secretly a weekend at Bernie's thing where only one or two people are involved and then you have a room full of people and suddenly I just like sit up and scare the fuck out of everyone. I feel like that's cool. I just don't get like the big lavish funerals. It's just fucking weird. I'd rather just scare the shit out of everybody before I get burned or tossed on the ground. I don't know. I never understood the big frilly funerals. Anyway, that's what he did because homie's a nobleman. Now, during this time, it's obviously customary for a widow to mourn for at least (laughs) one year. It's so fucking long, especially because their lives are so short. It's like, hey, you're going to live to be 30 years. Your husband's going to die, but you got to mourn for like at least one year. That's substantial, but whatever. Anyway, Elizabeth was already conducting business in Vienna four weeks after her husband's death, which was shocking to everyone. She was like, fuck this dude. I'm out here in Vienna conducting business. She organized the funeral and burial so quickly that many close relatives and friends didn't receive notification and were obviously unable to attend. This raised questions. Elizabeth then went on, just eight months later, a very lavish shopping spree. This was like a very big part of her story in multiple sources that I read, so I'm sharing it here. To me, it doesn't seem like a big red flag, but half the sources I read did, so... She purchased an exorbitant amount of clothing for a lump sum of 2,942 gold and 11 dinar, which was apparently an absolutely enormous amount of money at that time, and people thought it was weird. I don't know. Maybe she was just mourning. Then Elizabeth paid all remaining obligations owed by her husband, but she continued to support his charitable endeavors. She then took control over all asset management and protected the local clergy from predatory practices of other local nobility. Correspondence at the time reveals that she did trade costly and very rare jewelry with a few business partners and that she began to lend out cash or goods to servants and nobility. What's interesting about this is that several of these people will later testify against her. But Despite appearing as a complete paradox in public, I mean, she provided scholarships, supported the local clergy. She made these helpful loans to needy staff. She paid her bills promptly. She appeared at high society affairs. Elizabeth was doing something very sinister behind closed doors. Elizabeth spent her free time torturing servant and peasant girls in private. As I mentioned before, it's obvious that Frank was one of the people that first introduced her to this, but there was a clear escalation of torture and murder after her husband's death. It's hypothesized that she relied on a steady stream of income that her husband provided and the military provided, as well as social protection that his office brought to her while he was alive. But after he passed and that money dried up, the protection that she had evaporated her mental state began to deteriorate even further because, let's be fucking serious, it was nowhere near healthy to begin with, and she felt and became very vulnerable. Elizabeth was alone, and she was aging, and this is during a time when people typically died before 50. By 1605, Elizabeth had an intimate cohort of servants that served not only as her torturers, but also her execution squad. This included a woman named Anna, a young boy named Janos, and her children's wet nurse, Alona, as well as her elderly friend named Dorotoya and an elderly washwoman named Catalin. That's also her daughter's name. I'm going to be talking about both of them later, but I'll specify who. 
Alona, her children's wet nurse, was known as the cruelest amongst Elizabeth's accomplices. In 1609, Anna suffered from a stroke and became incapacitated, and at this point, Anna was Elizabeth's closest confidant. So this caused her to shift her loyalties and shift her to rely on a woman named Ursi Majorova, who was a forest witch, and she sought all of her advice from her. Now, Erzi was referred to as the Lady Steward or House Mistress of Miava, and this indicated that she held a close position to Elizabeth and had authority over the four remaining accomplices who ran Elizabeth's staff of domestics. Unsurprisingly, as Elizabeth became more attached with the forest witch, she was becoming more out of touch with reality. She began to obsess more and more over her advancing age and vulnerability, so she decided to turn to black magic for help, which I feel like is relatable for us women looking to anti-age. The forest witch lady house mistress twice removed Fortnight suggested that Elizabeth should try more drastic measures as if what she wasn't doing was not drastic already enough. Now, a lot of this up until this point is speculation and there's a lot of conflicting sources between whether or not she actually consulted somebody for black magic or not. It is confirmed that she did believe in black magic and the occult. So I'm just going to say what I think based on research I can say definitively is that up until this point, she was definitely killing peasants with her servants. Whether or not she was doing it to bathe in their blood for youth and vitality, that is unclear. But at this point, she did decide to escalate to noble girls instead of peasants. Whether it's because this forest witch actually told her to, or because she was actually killing so many peasant girls that there weren't many left, is unclear. I'm going to say that it's probably the latter. So I'm going to elaborate on exactly what happened later on, but at this point there are rumors swirling over disappearances of girls in the area, and by this point, parents began to hide their daughters whenever Elizabeth passed through town. Girls began to refuse to work at the castle, and things were becoming harder for the Blood Countess and her witch bitch. The witch bitch solved this problem by having her helpers travel farther and work harder to secure a steady supply of new female staff members, and they also began to engage a network of locals to help them. Ultimately, Elizabeth and her staff decided to draw the girls to the castle rather than trying to bring them in themselves. In the winter of 1609, Elizabeth opened an academy of etiquette, which was essentially a finishing school for high-born young women. And this is when her crimes actually begin to come to light. So I'm going to dive into them into more detail. So you've got the witch bitch and the blood countess, and they decide to open this bullshit finishing school. So, of course, noble families begin to send their daughters to Elizabeth's castle for instruction in social graces. And some of these young women were even related to Elizabeth by either blood or through marriage. Now, up until this point, it was speculated that there were weird goings-ons in terms of Elizabeth's castle and peasant girls, but now you have noble women, and obviously people are going to pay attention to this. Initially, a nobleman named Janos Blanczy became concerned when he received no word from his sister, who was recently admitted to this bullshit finishing school. Accompanied by his friend Martin Schnatty, the two men finally went to Elizabeth's estate to demand the girl's return, but ultimately Elizabeth refused, and that was it. She never returned. Noblewoman Anna Zlesthi testified that her daughter, Suzuska, had been given to the court where she had been so badly beaten and tortured that the flesh literally fell from her bones before she died after being returned to her care. Nobles Meliquire and Paul Nagathi testified that their sister had attended Elizabeth's finishing school. The brothers made multiple and extensive inquiries regarding her status, but learned that she died there, like everybody else. Another nobleman lost his sister, Anna, and a nobleman and another noblewoman noted that they had lost their daughter as well. Michael Horwath, who was provisor of Elizabeth's castle, said, quote, 
One could hear every day the sounds of beatings being heard, including the crying and lamenting of the beaten girls. The fact that they were beaten more and more often and that they could be heard crying changed nothing. He also stated that he knew of seven girls who died at the finishing school, including the daughter of a nobleman. On January 6th of 1610, Elizabeth's daughter Catalin was set to marry a lord, and the wedding was obviously going to be held at the castle, and Elizabeth planned a lavish event. However, Catalin and her mother, so her daughter, not the servant, were reputed to have tortured and burned two servant girls in their chambers on the night before the wedding. Both girls died while the wedding festivities were going on, and numerous servants and townspeople were aware of this fact and that their bodies were taken away for a secret burial. It's a really weird wedding gift. I don't really know that that's how you should celebrate your daughter getting married, but okay, Elizabeth. Not long after this, a young servant girl died in Elizabeth's castle, and the local pastor, Istvan Magyari, was called to the scene and found her body in a sealed casket. Additionally, a casket was found nailed shut with three bodies inside. Elizabeth confided to the pastor that they had a case of cholera on their hands, and she essentially did this to avoid creating a panic. But the pastor noticed that the female staff in the castle appeared nervous, and they were whispering amongst themselves when Elizabeth was around. Benedict Bixerdi, who was the castellan, which is the governor of the castle, was asked by Elizabeth to post an armed guard at a door leading to a series of inner rooms, not allowing anybody inside without her permission. And again, at this point, there were already rumors circulating, but now there are even more rumors that there were three girls that were found nailed inside of a casket. So people are starting to question what the fuck is up. This incident slowly turned into an ever-increasing stream of dead bodies that followed Elizabeth wherever she went. And at this point, the pastor ended up telling authorities that Elizabeth was killing young girls and using their blood to maintain her youthful appearance. The rumors around this time are also beginning to reach the King of Hungary. Initially, the authorities did not believe the claims against Elizabeth due to her status as a powerful and wealthy noblewoman. However, As more and more witnesses came forward with accounts of torture and murder that had taken place in her castle, they were inevitably forced to do their fucking job and investigate. By December of 1610, King Matthias II of Hungary ordered an investigation into the allegations against Elizabeth, which was carried out by two notaries that collected testimony from over 300 witnesses. The first deposed witness in the investigation against Elizabeth stated that he knew of at least 175 girls and women who had died, but he didn't know anything regarding the specific way that they died. There were several other servants, nobles, and clergy, as well as townspeople from the area and surrounding areas that came forward with similar testimonies. All of them noted that there were burials and funerals that took place at an alarming rate and that the dead were almost always young servant girls. Most notably was that access to the forbidden part of her estate, which was under heavy guard. Testimonies of 40 local villagers were recorded under oath that claimed to have heard stories of torture and murder at her castle. Count Georgi Thurzo, you might remember this is the man that fought alongside Elizabeth's husband's Frank, went to the castle to meet with Elizabeth before taking any final steps in the case asking her to account for the accusations and rumors against her. Elizabeth denied all of the accusations and ended up saying, hey guy, you want some tea and cakes? Then she went on to assure him that the allegations were pure nonsense. Elizabeth claimed that many of the girls who died died from an epidemic, if you remember I had mentioned cholera earlier, and that they had been buried quickly and in secret just to avoid a panic. More witnesses ended up coming forward describing in gruesome detail the torture and murder that had taken place in her castle, with many of these witnesses personally seeing the abuse firsthand. And some of these witnesses reported seeing Elizabeth herself participating in this torture. So essentially, Thurza was able to determine that everything that she was saying was pure fucking bullshit. So on December 29th of 1610, a group arrived at Elizabeth's castle with armed men, The group found a young girl's body near the entryway and two more young girls that appeared to have been stabbed and beaten. 
This group followed the sound of screaming and then found three old women and a young man, all servants of Elizabeth, the ones that I had mentioned earlier, torturing one of the girls with another child literally sitting there watching and waiting to be tortured next. All of these people can get fucked. I hope they had a shit ton of wrinkles and died of like, I don't know, fucking Ebola times a thousand. The four servants were apprehended, but despite Elizabeth's wealth and status, she was arrested as well. The caveat to that is they placed her under house arrest in her creepy murder castle that I feel like should have just been burned down. I'm going to detail the crimes as I talk about the trial. So I mentioned a trigger warning earlier, but just trigger warning again, because now I'm going to actually go back and detail the crimes. So there were two separate trials for Elizabeth. So two separate proceedings were conducted. One of these took place on January 2nd, 1611, in which the four servants that were apprehended with her at her castle were interrogated on criminal charges for their own misconduct. The other was a companion investigation in which eyewitnesses were called to testify against Elizabeth herself. There are two separate writings that memorialized both proceedings. The first document was titled The Transcript of Witness Interrogation Regarding the Cruel Deeds Which Elizabeth Bathory, Wife of Count Frank Nadasdi, is Accused, 1611. And this is the one that contains the testimony of the four defendants. So one of the defendants, one of the servants that testified, stated that he went out at least on six different occasions with another in search of girls, promising them future employment as assistants or maids. The defendant also listed women who, likely in exchange for substantial, quote, finder's fees, would assist in the procurement of girls. Some people even brought their own daughters to Elizabeth. I'm going to say it one more time. Some of these people even brought their own fucking kids to Elizabeth, knowing full well what would happen to them, but they were okay with it because money. Now, during this trial, Elizabeth's servants testified that she had not only tortured, but killed numerous young girls. She would often lock them in cages or beat them to death. Some of her victims were burned with hot irons or covered in honey and left to be eaten alive by insects. One of the most important sources during the trial was Elizabeth's diary, which was discovered when she was apprehended, and this diary gave good insight on her fucked up psyche and showed a woman who was deeply troubled and obsessed with beauty and youth, which is understandable, but just fucking get Botox. Jesus fucking Christ, this is so dramatic. This is just so extra, not necessary. In her diary, Elizabeth discussed her fears and fantasies, and one of those fantasies, allegedly, this is not to be confirmed, so, but it is widely speculated that one of those fantasies included a desire to bathe in the blood of young girls in order to stay beautiful and young. Court documents do show testimony that was given by a man named Benedict Dezio, who was Elizabeth's courtmaster during her trial, and Benedict testified that Elizabeth was a torturer. She was a murderer. She would withhold water from her victims until they were incredibly thirsty, and then she would force them to drink from her hand, almost to kind of reinforce her status in the house and, and kind of make them need her, even though she's the torturer. Benedict also testified that Elizabeth would burn the girl's arms with a wide fire iron until they turned to smoke and ash. And he said that she also used a smaller round fire iron that she would heat and trigger warning. Say it one more time, trigger warning. She would heat it up and then insert it into their vaginas. Benedict recounted a particularly gruesome incident where Elizabeth took a potato and she made sure that it was like scalding, smoking hot. And then she forced it into a young German girl's mouth. Benedict claimed that he did try to persuade Elizabeth numerous times to stop her from killing and torturing these girls, but he was obviously unsuccessful. Benedict then began to detail that Elizabeth hired an apothecary to provide her with antimony, which is a very poisonous substance. And this goes back to what I was saying with the forest witch. So this does kind of confirm that she did mess with poisons and maybe the occult a bit. So antimony is a very poisonous substance. And he also supported the fact that she was fascinated with the occult 
and she would seek assistance from a local peasant women that were trained in folk medicine, and a lot of them were also trained in the Black arts as well. Benedict said that a lot of these women provided Elizabeth with herbal medicine, but many others gave her drugs, poison like antimony, and magical spells. Something that did come out in testimony as well was that Elizabeth's servants eventually became careless in disposing of bodies from her castle. It became increasingly difficult for them to find ways to dispose of them because there were so many. One of her servants testified that five bodies were later tossed into a pit, two into the water canal in the castle garden, and two were brought at night to a neighboring town and buried in the church. Two of the servants described how five girls had happened to die at one time within a 10-day period at the castle. They had no idea what to do with the bodies, so they ended up being told to hide the remains under beds or put them into storage areas in the castle where they were living. One of these servants was charged with the task of lifting up the floor of the house, so pulling up the floorboards and burying the bodies underneath. With a servant's help, this other servant also was able to hide bodies in the canal, which were eventually discovered. At one point, the household staff came to a fucking stupid conclusion that if they were to drop four bodies over the walls of the castle, perhaps they would catch the attention of nearby wolves and you can solve for X there. That didn't happen, so those bodies were discovered as well, thankfully. Witness testimony from those present during the apprehension of the castle revealed that the procession went directly to the castle keep. This was the central fortification that contained the main tower as well as the dungeon prison. This is where they began to search for bodies and immediately the group found what they were looking for. While Elizabeth stood by and watched in silence, these men came upon the body of a dead girl. According to the castle provisor, when they came across this body, they placed a coat over her and they took her out on a cart, quote, before the eyes of even this lady widow, quote. He stated that Elizabeth departed soon after, and once she did that, the men gathered around to further inspect the dead bodies more closely, and the castle provisor reported that he saw cruel injuries to the victim's cheeks, shoulder blades, and hands, and said that they were inflicted with large wounds, severely burned. He stated that the flesh had appeared to be torn out with pliers, and another witness that was present stated that he saw before the eyes of the lady widow, Elizabeth, a dead girl lying in a box who had been killed by cruel blows. These men found another girl who had been tortured but was thankfully still alive, but she had wounds between her shoulder blades where the flesh had been cut out and her right hand and arm were permanently disfigured. This victim was taken away and treated by a doctor, and she had stated that Elizabeth herself was the one that caused those injuries to her right arm and hand. Several witnesses were able to testify, like the others, that they were able to see slash marks on the body of the dead girl that was taken out on the cart, along with shackle marks on her neck. Another witness stated that it seemed like she was strangled execution style. The wounds found on the other girl were so deep from the flesh being cut out that, quote, that one could easily stick a fist through them. An older woman was found among that group still alive who had her feet bound together. This woman was freed and she had recounted that she was tied because she had refused to hand over her daughter, her very own daughter, to Elizabeth Bathory. Now, Anna, that was one of the women that I had mentioned was one of her servants, and this is the one that she was closest to, and kind of she lost touch even more with reality when her health fell poorer. But she was a Croatian woman that served both Elizabeth and Frank, mainly Elizabeth, between 1601 to 1609. Now, Anna taught Elizabeth and the servants a lot of the torture methods that were used in the castle, including beating somebody up to 500 times until they died. She was described as, quote, a wild beast in female form and essentially served as the gatekeeper and personal advisor to Elizabeth. Rumors began circulating that Anna ran a torture chamber and a butcher shop, 
and witnesses allege that both Elizabeth and Frank knew about her actions and chose to participate as well. And this is something that came up as a big point of contention in trial. While the exact methods that Elizabeth and her accomplices used are unknown, it was common during these periods to use starvation, darkness, beatings, attempted drowning, so like waterboarding, burning, stretching and pulling, and pressing with heavy weights, as well as pinching, throttling, and the twisting and screwing of fingers, toes, and limbs. It was recorded that victims were tortured by binding their arms with venous cord and tying their hands behind their backs. Anna was responsible for doing all of this, so she would tie their hands backwards and whip them until their bodies were covered in gaping wounds. So she was really the main piece of shit in this really fucked up story, as well as Elizabeth. The victims were also beaten on the flat of their hands and the soles of their feet, again, receiving as many as 500 strikes in a row. One of these servants, although it is speculated which one, but there was one that was known to cut off the victim's hands with shears. Alona, I had mentioned her previously, was trusted by Elizabeth to serve as her nursemaid and raise her children. She, in particular, was on trial for butchering young girls, not much older than her noble charges, but during her trial, she did attempt to place pretty much all the blame on Anna, who was dead at this point. Alona was guilty of assisting in the torture and murder of victims. She stabbed victims with needles if their needlework was not done up to par. If the victims did not complete other tasks up to par, such as starting fires or laying aprons out straight, they were then taken by Alona to the torture chamber and then tortured to death. The woman, especially Alona, liked to burn the victims with fire irons, and Alona would stick pins into their mouths, noses, and chins. Trigger warning again, even though I've said it 800 times, Alona in particular, what she was known for was, this is really fucked up, just another FYI, she would stick her fingers into the victim's mouths and then try to pry it apart. So essentially, she fucking sucks. Also, again, Elizabeth trusted her children in this fucking sick fuck's hands. All of these people need a fucking lobotomy, and I don't even believe in lobotomies. I think I'm just hoping that somebody just fucking ice picks them and takes them out. Jesus Christ, these people are fucked. Anyway, between everybody involved, the victims were taken to be tortured as many as 10 times a day. They were essentially delivered like sheep. Sometimes four, five, six girls would stand and they'd make them stand naked before them and they would be forced to sew, knit, embroider, knit lace while watching this torturing go on and then they would suddenly be punished. Again, many of these victims would be buried at the estate and whenever somebody was murdered, whoever did it, so whatever servant did it, They were then given gifts by Elizabeth. One thing that was confirmed during trial is that Elizabeth did in fact torture and kill victims herself, but oftentimes she would participate in torture in almost like a sadomasochist way. She found like a weird fucked up pleasure from it. And so she would do that and then she would give her victims back to the old women that were her servants who would continue to torture the girls. Oftentimes, the victims were put in coal storage without food, and if anybody ever gave them something to eat in secret, they were immediately punished. So this was throughout the entire castle. If you did not participate in this, then you are going to be punished right along with whoever's being punished. On July 28, 1611, a notary recorded testimonies from 224 individuals regarding the crimes committed by Elizabeth and her accomplices. The testimonies were given by court officials, servants, administrators, townspeople, clergy, and nobles. The testimony revealed the involvement of not only Elizabeth, but the Bathory and Nadazdi families and the neighboring nobility in these murders. As I had mentioned before, Elizabeth's own husband, Frank, who was Hungary's war hero at the time, was exposed as a villain who also brutalized their servants. And 
he essentially taught his wife these bizarre torturing games and helped her initially cover up her murders prior to his passing. Now, Thurzo, the man who had served in the war with Ferenc, he repeatedly urged the king that Elizabeth could not be brought to public trial because of her nobility, and the king finally conceded, so she wasn't brought to public trial. He recommended the sentence of perpetuus carceribus, which means perpetual life imprisonment. So instead of Elizabeth receiving the death penalty, she would be imprisoned until she passed. However, Thurzo included a caveat. Legally, it would be as though Countess Elizabeth Bathory never existed. This meant that any documentation regarding Elizabeth, including all legal records of the incriminating proceedings, would inevitably be sealed. By order of Parliament, the name of Elizabeth Bathory would never be spoken again in polite society. The lands of other Hungarian nobles were temporarily preserved against undue Catholic advances. Additionally, the reputation of the Bathory and Nadazdi families, including Frank's national honors, were all to remain intact, and the estate that they had would be passed to Paul, the one surviving son. So, Elizabeth was sentenced to perpetual house arrest, where she could roam freely, however the fuck she wanted, throughout her castle. But it is believed that during the course of the various trials and tribunals, she was actually subjected to a much looser form of house arrest. But that can't be confirmed. After the December 1611 tribunal, Thurzo's sentence was enforced by means of walling her up. Allegedly, Elizabeth was walled in to her castle with only a single space left between the bricks, just large enough for the passage of food, supplies, and excrement. Elizabeth's daughter, Catalin, would bring her supplies such as candles, parchment, ink, and various food items during her confinement. While Elizabeth's accomplices were all executed, she remained confined to her castle until her death in 1614 at the age of 54. There's a lot of lore around her story, so I kind of want to touch upon that because I feel like it's kind of fun. So like I mentioned before, despite the wealth of sources available on Bathory, there's still a lot that remains unknown or subject to debate. For example, like I said in the beginning of the episode, the exact number of her victims is still very much a matter of dispute. Some sources suggest that she killed hundreds of young girls over the course of her life, while others claim that it's likely that her body count was much lower. One of the most notorious aspects about Elizabeth's crimes is the idea that she bathed in the blood of young virgins in order to maintain her youth and beauty. According to this legend, Elizabeth believed that the blood of virgins had rejuvenating properties and that by bathing in it, she could stay young and beautiful forever. This myth has been perpetuated in pop culture for centuries and has become really a defining part of Elizabeth's legend. There's little to no evidence out there to support this theory, but it has become synonymous with her name today. A lot of the historical records that surround her crimes is, again, distorted by legend and likely exaggerated. Some accounts claim that she would have her servants abduct young girls and then drain their blood into a bathtub, while others say that she would slit their throats and then bathe in their blood. According to pretty much all of the versions of this story that fall into this myth, she would eventually drink the blood of her victims in order to absorb their youth and vitality. So obviously, because this bitch allegedly bathed in blood, there have been many comparisons between Elizabeth Bathory and vampirism, which has been perpetuated in pop culture today. For example, the 1971 film Daughters of Darkness, which portrays Elizabeth as a lesbian vampire who seduces and kills young girls, which honestly sounds like a really shitty porno plot. There's also an Anne Rice novel, I don't read Anne Rice, do you? Called The Vampire Armand, which features a character who claims to have been a victim of Elizabeth's blood drinking. While portraits of Elizabeth that are known today do show a young woman with dark hair, a high forehead, and youthful features, none of the 300 plus witnesses that came forward during her trial mentioned her bathing in blood. And that story actually didn't even emerge until 200 years after her death. In the 1720s, Jesuit priest Laszlo Troxy discovered sealed trial documents and used them in his book, 
which essentially led to the blood bathing story that became popularized today. Alona Joe, the weird wet nurse slash psychopath, did state that Elizabeth beat and murdered girls until her clothes were soaked in their blood, but she did not say, nor is there any evidence, that she deliberately collected the blood for bathing purposes. There were some witnesses that said Elizabeth bit her victims in a fit of rage, but again, this doesn't make her a vampire. Ultimately, Elizabeth was just a sadistic killer who tortured and killed servant girls. So ultimately, there is little to no historical evidence to support the idea that Elizabeth was a vampire or that she even believed in vampire mythology at all. Most historians agree that her crimes were motivated by a desire for power and control rather than a belief in the supernatural or vampires that shimmer in the sunlight and drive fancy Volvos. If you don't get that, then watch Twilight. I can't help you. Other myths and legends surrounding Elizabeth include the idea that she was a witch who made pacts with the devil and that she was a lesbian who seduced and killed young girls and that she was possessed by evil spirits. Again, all of these are just weird, fucked up bullshit that have absolutely zero to do with the little trial documents that we have today. So today, Elizabeth Bathory is a very popular subject of books, films, and other weird forms of pop culture, with countless writers and artists drawing inspiration from her gruesome crimes. While the exact number of victims remains unknown, her legacy as one of history's most ruthless killers is likely to endure for many years to come. While we'll never know her true motivation or how many innocent people Elizabeth murdered, Elizabeth's crimes are infamous and horrific. She's believed to have tortured and killed as many as 650 young women between the years of 1602 and 1610 in what is now present-day Slovakia. What we do know is that Elizabeth's victims were young girls and women from peasant families who served as servants in her castle. Many of them were lured to the castle with the promise of work or education, but were then subjected to brutal physical and sexual abuse. Despite the lack of concrete evidence to support any myths and legends surrounding Elizabeth Bathory, what is clear is that Countess Elizabeth Bathory was a ruthless, sadistic killer who inflicted unimaginable suffering on her victims, and she will forever be known as one of history's most notorious serial killers. Please, if you liked what you heard today, like, review, subscribe. You can stream anywhere, leave a review. You can find me on every social media at F that pod, except for Instagram. It's at F that underscore pod, especially find me on TikTok at F that pod, because I'm just now starting to get the hang of it. And I feel like I'm doing pretty solid. Thanks for listening. 